one of the first, fastest, has one of the fastest growing economies in Africa, and we encourage a foreign direct investment. In fact, one of our areas of priority is economic diplomacy. So we are cooperating with, with other countries, including Austria, and for instance, in this region, Hungary and Slovakia, where we, we try and embrace new, newer technologies, uh, newer farming methods. Of course, uh, one of the challenges is lack of, uh, of uh, farmers having the finance to introduce some of these new technologies. Mm -hmm. But these technologies are definitely being used in farming now. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll have to round up soon. So I've got one more question going to Jonathan. In regard to the windmills, um, I believe that, especially in this part of the world, uh, in Europe, there has been a lot of opposition of windmills because of it impairing the landscape. Um, do you believe that there's some truth to it, uh, or is it just the media talking? Well, there are many different uh, points of views for uh, windmills in general. And I don't really want to take a position in the, in the big wind industry. Uh, I don't want to oppose it and I don't want to say, yeah, that's really good and we, pu we put it everywhere. Because I work with uh, small wind turbines up to maybe five or six meters in diameter. And this is not so much of a topic in my, uh, in my branch. So there is mostly, they are accepted in this size as something interesting, some interesting machine actually. When it comes to large wind energy systems, of course, there are different points of views and you can say it doesn't really look nice or I don't like it and other people say I really like it because it produces uh, uh, renewable energy. So, yeah, there, there are ups and downs, of course. And I, my personal opinion is that if, if you put them somewhere where they don't really uh, disturb anyone, then it's fine. But I wouldn't really like them 100 meters next to my house. Talking about big, big, big uh, winter parts. The small machines, it's different. You can put them anywhere, and they are not so big that they have really disturbed a lot of people by, by the optical, by the appearance, physical appearance. And how much voltage has the smaller one got? Or how much does it produce? I well, uh, it depends where you put it, of course. And if you, and also about the size is, a, is an important factor. If you have a yeah, let's say an, an example of, of wind turbines that I work with. If you put them somewhere where you have a, a good windy site with a, with a constant stream of wind and no obstacles around, then you can have enough energy to power a house. And that's not a problem in this size. But of course you can have much less if you put them on the wrong side. So it's hard to really say a number. It depends on many factors. And how much, how much time do you take to produce one of those windmills? Yeah, what, what I do is that I go around and I teach courses where we build a wind turbine and I don't produce them and sell them basically, I, I just uh, come there and then I have a group of people, mostly it's local people. For example, I was in Germany last week and we had uh, a group of 12 people from a village and these people sign up to this course and then we build a wind turbine together and I prepare all the materials and the tools. So we build it following a, a well-developed design, of course, not something random. It all has uh, some, some way to go and it's, it's developed. And after, after this course, the wind turbine is the finished product of this group and it goes somewhere where it will be installed and then produce electricity for a project. In this case, it was in Germany, it was for a sustainable building, uh, structural building uh, company project where they build houses with low energy demands. It's like the passive house, but it's not exactly like this, something different. And then it will be used there for electricity. It will be used there and produce electricity. The outcome of the project in the end is that people gain knowledge about the wind energy system, the participants in the course, and you have the, the turbine itself that is also a product, a physical product that can be used to provide electricity in a place where there is none or where, where people want clean electricity, let's say that way. Yeah. Thank you very much. 
I was just wondering how long it would possibly take to build one. To build one, yeah. Uh, it takes normally five days for a group of around 10 people to complete the project and the process of building it. And yeah, that's it basically. The, another, another important thing is the cost of the materials in the end, because the people who build it in the course, it's, it's, it's only the materials basically. Uh, it's about three to five hundred euros, depending on what what source of materials you can use, or if you have recycled materials that you can use, you don't have to buy new ones, and it's cheaper, of course. And if you buy everything, it's more expensive. Thank you very much. Where can we sign up for your courses? Uh, you can sign up for the courses on the website. My website is called pureselfmade.com, and there is uh, a list where you can. Uh, Write your email address down, and then you will get notification about the next course happening. And uh, it's not so many courses are public. Actually, I would like to do more public things, but it's mostly booked by closed groups, like universities or NGOs or something. But there are some public events on the website. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> um, we. We were in Kenya. We, of the, I mean, we crossed the equation just in Nyamururu, Your Excellency? Yes. yes. In Nyamururu. Um, there you have, uh, it's, it's a resort. It's more like a, a tourist uh, uh, town. And in this tourist town, there was a, uh, the KCC, the new KCC which uh, just last week or last month the deputy president was there. Now, as you will all understand, in developing countries or in emerging countries, one of the problems, one of the challenges they have towards um, prosperity, industrial development, and poverty elevation is energy. How can they generate energy either for the primary industry, industries, I'm talking about on-farm, off-farm, processing, and the rest. And then secondary industries where the package, the, it goes, it costs across the, 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 the whole sector, either from heavy duty manufacturing uh, sectors to on-farm, off-farm processing. And this is where uh, we had a very uh, challenging, mind-boggling, I would say, experience in Kenya. There is a creamery company. The shareholders are 45% the Kenyan government and 65% uh, farmers. And so these are cattle rearers where they collect milk, process it, I mean, put it in a cold storage somewhere and they send it to the creamery for packaging and processing. One of the problems this, cre this creamery or this milk processing company is having is energy. They have to run their dwellers and furnace oil. Now you have to know what furnace oil is. Furnace oil is more like the oil with the cheap, the, the cargo um, ships. After docking at the ports, they have to discharge this oil and then these heavy duty machineries or industries, they buy this oil still at a very high price and they use it. So it's country. So we heard a lot about different technologies we can use to be more efficient. But I think a really big question is how to implement these technologies and uh, uh, to and the other big question is how will the people who have to use these technologies accept them? Because I only know it for the passive house. It's even in Vienna, which is a really strong passive house city. It's hard that um, yeah architects, for example, accept the passive house standards because there's more easier ways to build buildings. Thank you very much. Who would like to take this? I think it starts with the policy. Where are we as a country, or who are we as a people? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, great. So, um, going from there, you 
You have to look at the, technology, the technologies that are available. Countries, look at the priorities. Let's start with the priorities of the countries. Where, what do countries want? I know Germany, Austria, and uh, uh, Sweden, and some of the Nordic countries, they are very, very much interested in energy conservation. And uh, heating, cooling, in all that aspect. How do they reduce the cost of either uh, heating or cooling, and at the same time at, uh, achieve uh, the same output of, uh, of heating and cooling. With that, these countries have come up with policies. The policy is like a guiding part. They say, we must do it. If we don't do it, we may have a problem later. Some of the, prob uh, some of the policies centered around your politics, economics, back and forth. When you have a policy in place and it is well explained to the people, you might not score a uh, hundred percent acceptance in the first ten to fifteen years, but you will be able to get a reasonable margin that will lead the implementation of that particular technology or innovation, and that is where you start from. Um, I can give examples of some countries where uh, they know that fossil fuel is very expensive to buy. They know getting gas is also very expensive to buy. It's becoming more and more, uh, more of a political might of some countries that are producing this. But at the same time, the policies and the people or the policy makers, they have other interests that plays into it. So, who is running it, who will get it, whose company is implementing it, and which region it will be implemented. I think, personally, that the implementation goes a long way. It goes with constant repetition of the return of investment over time, the cost, and the incentives that governments are ready to give when you take a particular or employ a particular um, technology, either in heating, in generating power, or uh, in facilitating your processes. With incentives and the right information package, I think we'll go a long way. Changing the minds of people takes a long time. It's not like this. In my little experience in the industrial sector, I've come to understand that you need to repeat these things like crazy. You just, every day, just go on the radio. You might win one person. So it is, it is not about the geometric progression, but rather the arithmetic progression of one today, two tomorrow, three the next day. I think that way, um, over a period of time, let's say 10, 15 years from now, we'll have a portion of people who believe in solar energy, and decide to go with the energy mix, solar, uh, uh, wind, uh, solar, uh, um, hydro, and the rest of it. Uh, just last month, no, sorry, last year, in my apartment, we decided to change our energy provider from one we think that is using or buying gas from a country, which is not really doing very well politically, we decided to switch our energy provider to an hydro provider here in Austria that we know it is clean on the one hand and at the same time it's not playing power into some people's hands. So there is a whole lot of there are a whole lot of envelopes that needs to be opened, needs to be opened, carefully analyzed and sold to the public in a more transparent way. Thank you. Thank you <coughs> So one is for you, Your Excellency. I'm, I'm looking at it not from Kenya perspective, now from Africa. So, first of all, let me congratulate you that it's a constitutional thing in Kenya that we have to have access to clean environment and stuff like that. And stuff like that. But then, do you think that cleanliness has been enough in this, uh, facing this challenge? Because we talked about poverty, how is it like poverty, and as well as lack of education. If somebody thinks it's cheaper, 
So that is second hand television or a refrigerator from Europe to use back home. First, it's not cheap because they believe they pay less. But this consumes more energy than the new ones. The new ones use uh, next to nothing energy consumption. But this old one, when you plug it, you see the meter running very fast. So if they are well educated, they will know that they are not even, it's not even cheaper, it's even more expensive. That is for secondly, even if they don't have the idea of how to uh, recycle this, like my, my brother said, that they have to teach them how to recycle this thing. So that not you, you buy a big TV, after you leave, you drop it somewhere else, it's a meeting or a politician if they are not environment. So do you think our leaders are doing enough? And the second question is for my petrol experts, Christos. We, uh, we are talking about this networking within farmers in Liberia. Do you think we can extend this thing also to be for being farmers within the world of Africa? For example, Nigeria is the largest producer of cassava. Okay. Most of most farmers deal only with the tuba alone you know, to make areas of things like that and trade with the leaves of it to give the Africa to to animals and stuff like that. But in some other countries, they even need this cassava leaf. I know in Congo, for example, they even feed. The woman eats even this cassava leaf. And then it's wasting rotting in Nigeria there, and you don't have enough there. So what do you think we should extend and is it going to be very easy to do? Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, th thank you for the question. Uh, my candid answer on that, I believe that African leaders are not doing enough. And I think there's much more that can, that can be done. One way is creating awareness, and two, the policies that we have. Unfortunately, in the 80s, we had a lot of uh, pressure from the West, and we embraced a liberalization policy. And this liberalization policy gave way to dumping of cheap and second-hand items in, in Africa generally. And I think that was because of pressure from some of the industrialized countries. Uh, but as, as I say, yes, uh, there is need to do more. Uh, some governments in Africa are trying, and in Kenya in particular, we are moving uh, in, even in terms of uh, embracing policies that, uh, for instance, recently we, we are trying to, we have been having a lot of uh, second-hand goods coming into Kenya, but we are trying to adopt uh, a free economic zone where products that are produced for Agoa, Agoa is, uh, is in cooperation with America where we export uh, new clothes. They are made in, in Kenya and, ex and exported. Some arrange agreement we have with them. So we are trying uh, to, to create that uh, situation where uh, people can actually buy new clothes, uh, for instance. But I think uh, we need uh, to prevent the dumping of old and obsolete uh, technology in Africa. Thank you. I go straight to your question. I, we encourage what we call value chain in commercial agriculture. Uh, what we are trying to do is to meet the needs of the consumers. Talking about consumer needs and satisfaction. It's true. It is possible to extend this technology. Very, very good. Because the librarians, for example, their favorite food is cassava leaf. They make cassava soup. If you go to Liberia and you don't eat cassava, you will survive there. <laughs> when Nigeria goes there, they will tell them cassava leaf is used in feeding goats. 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 Yes. Goats. Tell them. <laughs> they will tell you for a stupid because cassava is the favorite food there. That's number one. So this is possible. So what we do, what we did there, and what we are still doing is to have this. Uh, Farmers as partners in agribusiness. Those ones that are eating cassava leaf will get cassava leaf for the producers are not eating cassava leaves. Yeah? What else we do? Cassava peels, when you peel out of cassava, it's a source of fertilizer and feeds for the animals. Because they produce cassava in large, in large quantity, they just peel it, make curry, throw away the peels. So we now ask them to sell the pills to the farmers who are rearing animals. That's number one. So another one we also do is that we try to encourage farmers to just stop production. Don't do production. Your job is to market. We created what we call um, um, Chicken Village. Chicken Village is a village where they rear chicken, the country chicken. So 
every household, they have country chickens in their backyard. So we found out that the chicken are being reared and satisfied their needs there. What we did was to create a market in Morovia with government policy to encourage this village just to produce chicken. So a chicken can hatch 21 days, about 30 chicken. They are very viable chicken there. So what they are trying to do is to stop importation of, of frozen chicken from China. And through this technology that we're talking about, it's functioning. So we have platforms now, even WhatsApp, check it, there are all platforms that can tell you, in this village, I can buy my chicken. So we have a group of uh, people doing this. So I am also appealing to African farmers to join themselves together and inspire themselves and see what I'm producing and what you need, what you like, what you want to have, I send it to you. You give it what you're producing. Now we have a uh, fish pond. We have fish pond. Um, the cost of producing fish in Africa is very high because of the feed. So what we did was to encourage the rice farmers to produce more rice. They would beat this rice, we did it this rice horse with some particles of rice there and sell it, which they normally throw away, and sell it to the fish for the fish uh, farmers to feed their feet. One of the systems we are using. Going back also to, to technology, we have the tilapia fish, we have the, the catfish. The catfish farmers, how do they feed their, their catfish? So we have some, this is a blue light, electric light, that we also got from Austria. So we put the, the, the blue light on top of the, of the, of the pond. They have a lot of mosquitoes in that area. This blue light attracts the mosquito. Yeah? So we are trying to eradicate mosquito in that village. So the blue light would attract the mosquito and it will fall into the water. What happens to the mosquito? It will be on there. Good. So these are small, small things that we try to do and it is functioning very well. It is very fortunate. So the connection between the farmers is really is going very rapidly. Small, small scale technology is moving. I am not, I'm sorry to say that, I am not a supporter of large scale development at the moment. In Liberia. <laughs> you see, it is, it, you, you, you don't say it, you say it, it's you, you take time to tell people how it makes it to, can change. You cannot change people within one, within one year, within two years. So they have, they have to be involved in the system. So, not in Liberia, now in Africa. I'm telling you because we need to change our system of thinking. We need value chain analysis. We need to analyze the, what we are producing. If we don't do that, we will end up importing, importing, and importing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. Please. Um, I've got your hand, I've got your hand. The gentleman there at the back, you, then you, and then you. And then I'll continue, lady. Please. Sorry, the gentleman behind, very much at the back, he okay. put his hand in there. Yeah, my, my name is Mabu Mori. I'm actually, my name is Rubias <laughs> And uh, I'm happy that Festus uh, uh, has answered uh, a bit of a question without even uh, hearing the question. But, however, uh, even uh, uh, regarding agriculture, uh, agra, or whatever, I don't know what I'm saying. Is uh, you don't have to go on a large scale. I was going to talk about why didn't you introduce the Alongside the so-called smart, we also have to deal with the, the waste associated with paper and pulp. So we are suggesting to them to go into reed beds, where the reed beds you allow the the waste pulp and paper effluents to flow into a reed bed. The reed beds they absorb the the contaminants and they grow with it. You can invest those reed beds, cut them. Use them again as briquettes, as and they will serve as other source of biofuel for other industries, if not for the industries, but also for the farmers. So it's uh, we're trying to see how we can create a win-win, and the company knew that, and that's what they are doing. It's a million-dollar, billion-dollar company, I can say.
It's amazing what's happening there. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so I've got three hands here. First the lady, then the gentleman in the blue, and then you in the hat. So thank you. Um, I want to thank you, Rita, for, for this forum because it has shown us that there's some great is already happening in Africa, according to what President has said and the ambassador. So, uh, but you still see that some African countries are still, you know, are connecting to the West to bring the desperate place who may not understand the environment or the, the social, you know, infrastructure there. So, how do I want to ask an ambassador? How do we tap into this? How do we create more harness and intra African? the reading or sharing of ideas, where you can move expertise from around Africa, you know, to help ourselves. That way we can, because people understand ourselves better. Then the second question is, uh, um, well, having been in Vienna, for the first time I'm still eating fresh corn, <laughs> even after the planting season. So I'll ask first also any expert here, how do we preserve freshness of the uh, palm produce? Because we only enjoy this you know, corn, fresh, fresh corn only during this particular season or fresh fruit. After that, it's gone. So how can we, is it difficult? How can we, you know, uh, tap into this? Thanks a lot. I thought we were taking two voices when we have a Sorry. Sorry. Yeah, so let's, can I? Yeah. Okay, sorry. Uh, good evening. My name is Sir Jacob Sedlu. I'm uh, a little bit, I think it's uh, quite interesting topic and uh, thank you, Rita. I mean, my, my observation or my point in this is that uh, energy poverty is a challenge that has to be addressed before you can even talk about sustainability in terms of uh, the environment. Having said that, I am going to take a cue from uh, Rita's uh, comment on freshness, and that's what I've not heard here. We know statistics are out there that the quantum of food that is destroyed due to preservation challenges, transportation, and getting, getting them to market. And then there are also statistics about those food that also get to market that are not bought in time, and they are destroyed as well. What, what, what do we do in terms of as a people, this quantum, almost 30, 40%. And if you are talking a value chain and you are losing 30, 40%, where's your efficiency if you cannot try to drag down this number? For example, I give you a very practical challenge you find, maybe in Nigeria, which we are all familiar with, which also ties in with what she was saying. Tomatoes is produced up north. Before you get them to Lagos, where majorly the market is, they are destroyed. Or look at oranges. During the orange season, oranges are apparently going for very, uh, very cheap. But when they are off-season, the prices they skyrock, they pick up because we, we are not able to convert them either to juice or something. So the, the experts here, what are the, those things you think we can do or suggest in order to uh, bring down this number, especially for the African uh, people? Thank you. So my name is Sama Chaba. I'm coming from Togo. My so good. Um, I have a question about uh, uh, e-waste. Mm, they say that uh, the how to how to say it um, the electric of tomorrow is uh, who don't have how uh, informatic knowledge. So in Togo there is a program that the go the government makes so that anybody that want to bring uh, electronic uh, items is free of charge, uh, uh, port charge, you can bring it out so that people will have more access to informatic uh, items. So right now, a lot of those items are coming in the country. What is also good, is going to help a lot of children to, uh, to have the material, the, the, the need to, uh, uh, to learn. But I can imagine that in the next 20 years, it's going to be a lot of waste in, in that country. So um, I'm not a, a professional, uh, people are here, and I would like to know what will, uh, will be a solution uh, uh, to that kind of situation. Mm. Thank you. I think maybe you would answer that question, being mm. uh, expertise in waste management. So let's start off with the ambassador, please. Yeah, okay, yes. <coughs> I think uh, one way to some of these issues is through intra-Africa cooperation. Already uh, we have a lot of regional bodies. These are, these are uh, vehicles that can be used uh, for this type of cooperation. For instance, the East African community, SADAC, ECOWAS, and so on. 
uh, where ideas can be ch exchanged and knowledge can be exchanged. And, and these are very good uh, uh, institutions. And there's a lot of cooperation now, like for instance in the uh, East African community, now we have moved from a common market, yeah? We are, we, are, we are going deeper into integration, first of all, uh, in, in, in the economic field and in different areas. So, and, and also, uh, a lot can be achieved through diplomacy. Uh, we, we have, like, for instance, in some of the, in the at multilateral level, we have, uh, for instance, like Africa Group, Group of 77, where there is a lot of cooperation in different uh, sectors of the economy. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, Mr. Yes, uh, preservation of food. Uh, we know for sure that that is one of those things that we need in Africa. How to preserve food. Due to our temperature, due to our temperature we cannot preserve food as much as possible. But let me advise you one thing. The banana that we eat here, if we harvest it green, yeah, with a tailing, they can get them right here. To show you that. Let us come to the to preservation. We have still we still have a very really long way to go to, re to recognize that the nature has been, been blessed by the nature. Let me give an example of marbles. The best marble producing country in the world is Senegal, that's the Kosovo. Then if you go to the market here, you will see some marble chips that have been dried, have been sold. The first marble drying a uh, company or organization in Plaza Kosomo in Senegal invited me to do that. That was 1996. So they are producing very well marbles there. So what we can do in Africa is how can I preserve my product for at least five days to reach the market? Is that a question there? We Talk about this, I spoke about before, we have what we call, we try to use the, the throw away containers it's to, to transport goods to Africa. If you go to somewhere like, like Morovia, Agricole, Spring Town, you see these containers being dumped somewhere. We try to convert the containers into cooling system with solar energy at least for them to preserve their vegetables for the next three months, then three or four days. Rita mentioned corn that have been preserved here, as you can even eat corn during the non-production season. This is true. Um, don't be disappointed again. I work with Agrama Tosphere. We do test this corn. We know the effect on human body, how it's been preserved. What we do in Africa is that we try as much as possible to preserve our product to drying, which we do with yam. We dry yam because yam, we they used to do powdered yam. Here they buy the, the powdered yam. How can we preserve yam that use it to do powdered yam? So we dry, we just parboil it. We will slice it, we will parboil it and dry it and pound it and packet it for export. With that. Tomatoes, the same thing we do. So the fresh tomatoes you see here, they are harvested green, not ripe. So a time <clears throat> before they get to the market, um, I don't want to go into, in, into the terminology of how they do it, I don't want to mention many things here because it, they be sprayed with it, ethylene. Within a few days, they have it right. Yeah. So I really think very much ecological when I'm doing a production system in Nigeria. How can I produce biological do biological production so that people are not pumped with chemicals? We should be very sensitive to this issue. I am also a case GMO. GMO, genetic modified. So maybe for people that are for millions, it's a good idea. For me, I am against it. 
So the, most of these fruits are genetic modified that they can resist for more than one week. I think that we in Africa our market is still very, very, very good to produce biological products. The only thing I have to do is how can I preserve these products for the next few days, for the next few days for consumption. This is why we come back to value chain. Value chain in commercial agriculture is an important area that the West African government did not um, they, they have recognized. We were sent to West Africa to Liberia to go and encourage agri business. The first thing we did was to see how can we add value to the production system that we are right now. How can we now use mammals as an example to add value to the process? We have mammal juice being produced. This time around, if you go to Liberia, you have mammals everywhere. A few weeks later, they are gone. It's, it's a big problem in Africa. Because we have not gone to that extent of using preservative chemicals or gases to preserve our food. Maybe the time will come that we can also have a corn for 12 months in a year, but we are still on the way going there. So I think I have answered the question. Okay. No, no, maybe I uh, maybe we didn't quite get you right. I can my question. Sorry. Perhaps because we're we're running out of time here. I just want to pass on the last uh, question to Jesse. And then afterwards, we'll have to break up. I think we'll have a chance for us all to mingle. And if you have any pending questions, you can ask them individually. So on this note, we've got a microphone. Okay. Um, you see, there is, when I was in, a, in my undergraduate years, they say, my technology, uh, computer science, professor said, when you buy technology today, it's already old. So, you go to Saturn, you buy your Apple, whatever, it's already an old product. So are policies. The day you create or enact or design a policy, it is already an old policy. Policies are created designed to address specific needs over a period of time. So there is a necessity. There is a need why that policy, for in this case, Togo, was said, Let us, let's open the borders because probably a country did not have the economic might or the capacities or financial uh, facilities to produce or provide um, computers for educational purposes. So they see that, okay, you know what? So or so we're going to die. But let's die standing. And dying standing is opening the borders, reducing the stringent, I mean, international standards on what kind of um, computer, computers that can come into the country. They did that for a particular reason. And one of the reasons from which I could get from you was to at least provide and uh, uh, create an access where everybody, uh, computer uh, systems are accessible, affordable, and can contribute to education. Good. But just like that policy or those kind of policies were created, they are already old. Because like you said, you are already seeing the problem is going to be in the next 15 years, 20 years. So what do you do? Immediately you will design a policy, from my experience. You will start thinking, how can this policy be either reviewed over a period of time, so you have policies review. Some countries, they do that every 12 months. Some, I mean, depending on the need, some they do it over five years to 10 years. So they say, okay, we will allow computers to come in for a period of 10 years. After that, we create a ceiling, we stop. Because we know that the more influx, of this computer waste, I mean, refurbished computers, coming into the country, the more problem we will have either disposing them, the more problems we will have uh, with energy requirements. Because, as you know, our phones 
computers, if you buy a computer, let's say 15 years ago, it consumes more energy than if you buy one today. They are not energy efficient. So they are looking, you have to start looking into energy generation, waste disposal, and the purpose of the computer. A 386 series of 1995 has nothing to do, has very, very little thing to contribute to education nowadays. So you need high tech, fast, multi-purpose, webcam, da 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 da. So I think what this government in particular should do is to review that policy. At least carry out an carry out a baseline or uh, assessment, an evaluation of that policy. Has this policy helped us in the last 10 years? Yes, no. If no, what else do we do? Because if no, you don't bond, you don't close, you have to also seek of alternative of alleviating a particular challenge or problem. Two, once you understand that that is not doing your country any good in terms of environmental and, 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 and energy consumption, energy requirements, you have to come up with a, a policy. The policy is we ban it or we reduce it to a certain or you come up, you, you, you know, you put your, your hurdles to reduce the influx of that particular product or lines of product. You have to start monitoring at your borders. Your customs have to start enforcing the policy that uh, where was this computer made, where is it coming from, and uh, so policies, all those things have to be put in place. And then you have to start raising the awareness of your consumers and say, you know what, good you have a cheap com a computer, but like my colleague said, it's consuming more energy than, so your electricity bill will skyrocket, you think you are learning, Maybe the computer is just really used for going on Instagram or Facebook, but you're paying for it. So you're consuming more energy, and it's not actually getting you out of poverty, it's sinking you more into poverty because you're talking about income. And then you have to talk about planning. How can this country start doing things in the right direction? We've allowed this. It is our problem. How can we manage our problem? How can we manage our challenges? Financially and otherwise. So I, I think um, it's a more technical uh, thing. It has policy makers have to be involved in the process. Um, the communities or the people have to be involved in the process. It will take time before you can actually turn the tide um, around towards discouraging the buying and importation of these uh, things and um, directing people's attention towards using more efficient, modern computer and accessible within the country. So trade deals, economic considerations, partnerships, um, incentives, uh, economic zones where Toshiba, um, Dell, coming to Togo, very, very good a position also for Nigeria, Ghana. You know what I'm talking about. So government have to be involved in it. So policy and uh, all that economic consideration has to be taken into uh, things. Thank you. Thank you very much. I actually thank you for coming. Um, I hope you managed to take some information away with you and see the opportunities that they are to tap into Africa's market. But not just simply to tap into the market, but also to see how you can contribute to the environmental should I say, sustainability of the continent as well. So, um, in this regard, I would like to end it here. Um, behind us, we have uh, refreshments. Please help yourself. Please mingle. Please ask questions. And let's keep the dialogue going. Thank you very much.